Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad podcast, produced by Bob and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet. I happen to be one of them. Uh, my name is Bob, and I'm exactly one half of the Bob and Brad team. And today, we're having a repeat guest. The first, uh, in, uh, the first interview went so well that we had to bring him back. Uh, it's Brad Walker. I'm, those, all I'm going to say about him is that he is the the man when it comes to stretching. He knows everything there is to know about it. He does all the research. He's got a great website, stretchcoach.com. Check it out. And he's written at least a dozen books. We'll mention them, some of them during the show. Uh, please welcome Brad Walker along with me. Welcome back to the program, Brad Walker. So glad to have you. Thanks, Bob. It's uh, always a pleasure to talk and uh, yeah, really glad to be able to catch up today. Um, well, we're going to jump over to uh, more sports injury now. And um, I would like to bring out your other book here, one of your other books, um, The Anatomy of Sports Injuries. Again, very well written, very well, um, got great, again, diagrams. Um, who was this book for? Is this for the layperson? Is it for the professional? It's, it's sort of right in the middle there. It's um, it, it's definitely for the layperson, um, but it is quite detailed. There's a lot of information in there. It's um, it's very comprehensive, um, but it's also for the professional as well. Um, you know, very much for a sort of a, a quick reference guide. Um, you know, the professional can sort of grab it. Um, you know, look up the injury that they're dealing with, and then they've got sort of a, a quick reference to, you know, what the injury is, um, how to prevent it, how to treat it, all that sort of stuff as well. Yeah, laid out really well. So uh, let's start with some of the questions about uh, sports injuries. Uh, why do injuries occur, sports injuries? Yeah, look, I've got a sort of a, a different sort of philosophy around why injuries occur. Um, you know, most people, when you ask that question, or if you go and search that question online, you'll get things like, um, you know, your shoes were worn out, or you're, you know, exercising in the wrong shoes, or you did too much, or, um, you know, all those sort of answers that we've heard, you know, a thousand times over. Yes. Um, I try and go a little bit deeper in that. So, you know, I sort of ask the question, why were you training in worn out shoes? Why did you do too much and so forth? So firstly, we've probably got to sort of talk about the type of injuries um, we're discussing here. Um, you know, we're talking about those soft tissue injuries like sprains and strains and that sort of stuff. Um, you know, we're not talking about broken bones and concussions sure. and all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, we want to be clear about the sort of the, type of injuries uh, we're talking about. Um, but look, I've, I've got a, a couple of ideas on why um, these types of injuries occurred. Typically, these sort of chronic overuse type injuries. So these injuries that sort of build up over time. Um, now, obviously, you know, accident is um, a, a cause of injury. So right. you know, if you're running along and you accidentally step into a pothole or you trip over something and sprain your ankle, um, you know, that's obviously one cause of injury, which um, there's, there's some things we can do, but a lot of those accident type injuries, they're just sort of out of our control. Right. Um, but there's probably two areas where I think, um, you know, lead to these type of injuries. Um, the first one is, is just ignorance, just not knowing what you don't know. Um, and you see this a lot in um, new people that have taken up a, um, like a new sport or a new right. activity. Um, you know, they just don't know how to train properly. They don't know um, what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing. And oftentimes this leads to injury. Um, but the other area that's a common cause of, in, of, of injury is ego. Um, you know, we often, um, I think just about everyone's guilty of it. Yes. Um, men probably more so than women. Yes. Um, we get in situations, especially where we're training with, with other people, and, um, you know, I don't know how many times I've heard the phrase, I knew I shouldn't have. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's, that's ego. That's, you know, right. that's, that's not ignorance. You know, ignorance is, well, I didn't know I should have, I, I, I shouldn't have done that. Um, ego is knowing that you shouldn't have done it, but you do it anyway. That's um, right. And that's sort of, you know, you get in the heat of the moment, um, you know, 
the running group and someone's running faster than you want to, but you know, you keep up with them and you push yourself and uh, at the end of it, you've, you've got a sore calf or something. And it's like, you know, right. oh, damn it. I knew I shouldn't have done that, but uh, you know, here I am and I've, I've, I've uh, overdone it. Okay. So um, yeah, just keep those things in mind. I mean, ignorance, the, the, the thing I'd, I'd recommend is, um, is getting in, uh, getting involved with a coach or some sort of coaching group. Um, you can have some guidance and some sort of recommendations and so forth. I mean, you can have the opportunity to ask questions and sort of get feedback on, on how to train and the best ways to train and how to avoid, uh, you know, the mistakes that people have made. Um, ego, it's all about uh, just, you know, trying to keep that ego in check and just asking right. yourself, um, should I really be doing this? Um, you know, do I need to do this? I find uh, with myself and a lot of the athletes that I've worked with, you set the standard for what you want to do during the training session. Um, so you set your goals of what you want to achieve, uh, what you want to do, what sort of training session it's going to be. Um, and then you just remind yourself throughout the training session, you know, this is what I'm, I'm here to do, uh, especially working with a lot of endurance athletes. A lot of time is spent just, just you know, getting the miles under your belt. Sure. Um, so, yeah, you've got to remind yourself, you know, is this session supposed to be hard? Am I supposed to be, you know, working hard or is it just an endurance session where I just need to, to you know, tick off the miles? So, um, yeah, setting your goals before you actually start training can sort of help to keep that ego in check. Sure. Makes sense. As humans, we are flawed. There's no doubt about it. Okay. So I wonder if you'd go over some of the components of injury management. Um the injury prevention mindset and you know what I'm referring to? Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, when it comes to um, injury management, um, it's really important to start with the right mindset. <clears throat> um, and, and one of the things I sort of learned very early on, I had a, had a coach that I worked with um, in the late nineties and, and early two thousands. <clears throat> um, and his philosophy was always uh, aim to be a better athlete rather than a faster athlete. So a lot of times when people, and I mean, faster could mean more. It, it or stronger. Mean, exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, instead of focusing on being faster and being stronger and trying to lift more and trying to run faster and all that sort of stuff, which, um, you know, let's be honest, honest, for most athletes and sports people, that's what it's all about. Right. They, you know, they're just focused on getting faster, you know, if they're, if today's workout wasn't faster than yesterday's workout, they're disappointed and they see it as a failure. So right. um, his philosophy was always aim to be better. And what, what he meant by that was um, aim to be technically better. You know, if you're a runner, aim to be a technically better runner, be a, be a uh, you know, concentrate on your form, your technique, your biomechanics, that sort of stuff. Um, uh, you know, if you're a swimmer or a weightlifter or whatever, um, you know, work on being a better swimmer, a better weightlifter. Uh, and the, the faster and the stronger will come as a byproduct of you getting better rather than focus on getting faster and, um, you know, ignoring um, all those things that make you a better athlete. Because when you're concentrating on, on being faster, you're sort of missing all those little things that make up great athletes. You know, when you look at great athletes, their form is beautiful. Right. Uh, you know, they're, they're so poised and controlled and, um, you know, there's so many things that make them that, that, that great athlete. So focus on those things and the faster, the stronger, all the rest of it, it'll come time. Um, the other thing that does is help to create some consistency um, one of the biggest sort of drawbacks, the biggest flaws, training and, and trying to compete is that um, is, is a lack of consistency. Um, so you're always pushing to be faster. We always pushing to be stronger. Um, you have these sort of ebbs and flows where you, you know, one, one week you're going, your training's going great. And then the next week you sort of fall in a hole because you've overdone it. Um, and you need to take some time off. And this lack of consistency really causes problems over the long term um, for, you know, achieving the goals and getting that improvement that you, uh, that you were aiming for. Yeah. Um, just 
one comment about the uh, form. You know, whenever I watch a runner, you can see when they start losing their form. It's late in the race, and that's when they start collapsing. And the same with lifters. You can see when they start losing their form, and that's when they can't lift. So, I mean, it's like you said, I think you mentioned uh, form is king. I mean, and biomechanics are king. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, for sure, as far as injury prevention is concerned, you know, a lot of people will talk about, you know, things like shoes and, and not training too much and all that sort of stuff. But form and technique and biomechanics yes. are so important in injury prevention. I don't think anyone realizes uh, just how important they are how much they contribute to you staying uh, injury yes. free. Um, I know just as a, as an example, um, you know, when I was, when I was uh, in doing triathlon, um, I was very young in my teenage years, done a bit of cross country running and I was sort of just getting into triathlon. So I'd never really done a lot of running on the road or anything like that. Um, and I was, I was struggling to get my mileage past about 40 or 50 kilometers. So that's about 25, 30 miles a week. Um, sure. and I just, I, I just couldn't do it. You know, I'd get up to that. I'd try and go beyond that. And then I'd pay for it the next week. Um, and when I started working on my technique, my form, I started to become a better runner. All of a sudden I went from doing sort of 50 K a week to like 70, 80 K a week. Um, and, and I wanted to do more, um, and you, 70 K a week was easy. And you weren't working harder. I wasn't working oh. harder. I wasn't, you know, I was actually probably working easier. Sure. Um, the running was coming to me a lot easier. Um, I was a lot less sore from the running. Uh, it didn't take as much out of me. Um, and that was all down to just changing my technique, changing my form and becoming a better, better runner. I think uh, what we talked about previously comes into play here too. The ego, you know, especially weightlifters, they always want to lift more, but they really should spend more time on technique than anything. Exactly. Far. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the long-term approach, and I get it. Everyone wants a quick fix. They want to be able to, you know, show that they can lift more or run faster today. Um, but, yeah, you really need to take that long-term approach uh, to, to, to your performance um, and work on things over the long term, and you'll find you'll be a much better athlete uh, you'll stay injury free and um, and you, you'll achieve those goals uh, a lot a lot quicker anyway because a lot of the time when you are trying to do more than your body's capable of um, you'll never reach that potential anyway um, oftentimes you have a sort of a ceiling a self-imposed right. ceiling based on your lack of form and lack of technique you know with the current technique you have you are only going to lift this much that's it um, until you improve that technique, um, you know, you're not going to lift any more than that. No matter how hard you try, um, you'll probably sure. just end up hurting yourself. And it also ties back to what we were talking about previously, um, muscle imbalances. I mean, if you're tight on one side and not the other side, that's going to throw off your technique and you, you're not going to be able to lift as much or run as well. And mm -hmm. so... Yeah, that. exactly. And, and, you know, when you try and force, when you do have an imbalance, try and force the weight or you try and force the speed, you only exaggerate that imbalance and yourself more susceptible. Sure. sure. So there's so sure. much to be said for improving yourself, um, making you a better athlete from a technical perspective. Um, you know, and a lot of that comes down to things like core strength and flexibility and mobility and all that sort of stuff. Um, a lot of the stuff that we don't necessarily want to work on, um, especially from an endurance athlete point of right, view, right. Um, most endurance athletes, they just want to get out there and ride their bike or run or swim or whatever. Right. Um, and they don't want to sort of take a step back and take the time to actually work on those things. They'd rather just, you know, uh, you know, like swimmers, for example, um, I've swum with dozens of different squads and it always amazes me. Um, the coach will usually do some sort of uh, technical work, some sort of form work. So they'll do swimming to help swimmer. And just about every time everyone sort of groans and moans during the drills. and they, <laughs> they go through the motions of doing the drills, but as soon as the drills are over, just go back to the way they were swimming sure. beforehand, you know, where the whole idea of the drill is to change your technique in a small way 
um, so that you become a better swimmer. But, you know, one's interested in, in that. They just want to swim right. harder and faster. So, um, yeah, very ironic because if they took the time to become a better swimmer, they'd be faster swimmer than faster they want to swimmer. be. Right. So, anyway. Swimmers want to swim, runners want to run. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you, uh, would you like to talk about hydration and maybe sleep a little bit? Yeah, I think these, these are two areas that are really underestimated in uh, both injury prevention and injury treatment as well. Um, I think a lot of us are just chronically dehydrated. We don't even realise how dehydrated we are. Um, yeah, so, and, and that affects your recovery. It affects your, you know, your, your prevention of injury and, and, and all that as well. Um, so yeah, having being fully hydrated, um, you know, helps those muscles recover quickly. Um, and like, like I said, I think a lot of people just don't even realize how dehydrated they are. Um, do, you have any, you, do you have any indicators um, that people could look out for on uh, themselves? Yeah, look, the one I always sort of default to is the uh, color of your urine. So, um, you know, when you go to the toilet, when you, when right. you pee. Um, you know, take a look at the color of your urine. If it's dark uh, in color, then you're, uh, that's an indicator that you're dehydrated. Um, so essentially, you want to drink water until you pee clear. Um, so that's always a good indicator as to your sure. uh, hyd uh, hydration levels. Um, the other thing too is, is, is the use of coffee. Um, it's, I don't think people understand just how bad coffee is for them, um, not only from a sports injury perspective, but just just from a general health perspective, um, you know, and it's not it's not necessarily caffeine. Um, caffeine uh, used correctly um, can be very beneficial for athletes, um, but there's just something about coffee, and you know, I don't have any research on on this to sort of back up what I'm saying or anything, but I've just noticed over the years that. Um, that drink a lot of coffee, um, oftentimes have have tight muscles. Oftentimes have sort of muscles that are very hard to loosen up and so forth. Um, the other thing is that coffee can be very dehydrating as well. So you add that add to the fact that you're not drinking enough water to start with, right. uh, and then all of a sudden you're drinking a, a you know a heap of uh, you know a lot of coffee. Um, it just it, um, exasperates the the uh, the problem. Um, so yeah, I would encourage um, all people, not just athletes, but all people just to sort of back off on the coffee as much as possible. Um, if you are going to have coffee, only have it early on in the day. Um, don't have it after sort of lunchtime. Um, and yeah, just try and reduce that coffee as much as possible. Um, I think, well, just about every person I've worked with, uh, when they do get rid of the coffee, um, they always say what a difference it makes. So, no. um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, yeah, I, I would really encourage people to try and uh, try and get rid of it as much as possible. Yeah, I've never been a coffee drinker, and I thought, well, why would I would try to become one? <laughs> and uh, you're right. I mean, if you have it, in, the caffeine could stay in your system for quite a while. The half life. I mean, so. Um, I think it's like after two o'clock for sure in the mm. afternoon that it may keep you awake. So yeah, 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 yeah. I think I, I can't remember exactly. I think it's a half life of twelve hours or something. So, right, right. You, know, you, you think if you have a have a coffee in the afternoon and then the first thing you do in the morning when you wake up is have another one, you, you never get rid of that caffeine right. out of your system, basically. So um, exactly. yeah, yeah. So it can make a really uh, really big difference. Um, should we talk about warm up and cool down? Yeah, yeah. I, let, let's talk about sleep too. I, I forgot. Oh to yeah, mention. sure. Um, yeah, 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 look, absolutely. You know, sleep is another is another area where uh, people just so underestimate uh, the benefits of sleep. Um, and again, the same with de uh, with dehydration. I think a lot of people are just so chronically overtired they don't even realise uh, that they're as tired as they really are. Um, I mean, we've all had the experience of when we finally do get a rest or when we finally do sort of go on holidays or something like that, our body just sort of shuts down and we end up getting sick or, you know, we end up spending sort of three days in bed and you know, can sort of barely um, function properly um, when we finally sort of allow our body to rest and, um, and 
get some get some recovery. Um, so yeah, I mean, sleep is another thing that uh, just so contributes to um, not only sort of general well-being, but you know, as an athlete, being able to function properly and um, heal from injuries and so forth. Um, so yeah, it's a it's sort of a it, it's a funny thing, you know. People, if they do get thirsty, you know, they have a drink. If they get hungry, they eat. But if they get tired, they sort of you know chug a coffee or a red right, bull. Right, exactly. You know, push through it it's this i suppose it's this sort of macho uh mentality we've got to sort of push through this and fight through it um but long term i think it has such a detrimental effect on people's you know general health um that they don't just don't realize how how much of an effect it does have on their uh on their physical well-being yeah i've read a, I've read a couple of books on it and it's like devastating what it can do to the body that's amazing and you know we're the only animal or species on earth that will purposely cut our sleep short every other animal unless they're hungry will will make sure they get plenty of sleep i mean yeah. or again the entire sleep so so oh, maybe we could go to warm up and cool down now yeah, to... yeah. So I spoke a little bit before about my warm up, and, and I mentioned the fact that I, you know, I really don't do a lot of stretching during my warm ups and cool downs. Sure. Um, I think a, a, a lot of people make the mistake of stretching too hard during the warm up and cool down. Um, you know, the warm up is not the time to try and improve your flexibility. Uh, that's not the purpose of stretching during a warm up. Sure. Um, all, all you want to be doing is just very gently. Uh, loosening up the muscles, um, just getting them ready for the workout that you're going to do. Um, so any static stretching you do, you want to keep it very short. So you, you're only going to hold those static stretches for, for maybe four or five seconds um, just to start to elongate those muscle groups. Um, and you don't want to put them under any real stress or pressure. So, um, you know, you really only want to be, say, pushing them to sort of 70, 80 percent of what they're capable of doing. Um, and just doing sort of very gentle stretching um, as part of your warm up, um, throw in some dynamic sort of stretching. So arm swings, leg swings, uh, trunk rotations, that sort of stuff. Um, that'll help to sort of loosen you up and sort of get you ready for your workout. Um, so, for example, when I go for a run, I usually start off really slowly and I'll only run for sort of a couple of hundred metres Sure. Uh, then I'll stop on the side of the road or the side of a, you know, a, a trail that I'm running on. Um, and I'll do some very gentle stretches for maybe one or two minutes. And I'll, I'll, I'll head off again. And depending on our, how I feel, um, I might stop after another couple of hundred meters, do a few gotcha. more stretches. If I feel any sort of little tight spots or any little restrictions or niggles anywhere, um, I'll stop and I'll just work on those particular areas and sort of make sure I'm sort of loose and limber and, um, and ready to go. Um, same when I swim, you know, I'll, I'll do a few hundred meters of swimming, then I'll stop and do a few sort of gentle stretches. Um, on the bike, I'll ride for, a, you know, a, a couple of miles uh, and then I'll sort of stand up out of the seat, have a bit of a stretch, move around a little bit um, and then sort of into my sort of workout, so to speak. So, um, I think if you do that with, uh, you know, whatever you're doing, whether it's, you know, lifting weights in the gym, if you just sort of lift easy for a, a few minutes, um, sort of feel where am I feeling tight today um, or what am I working on today and just do some very gentle exercises, very gentle stretches just to loosen up those areas. When it comes to the cool down, again, I think, uh, I think a lot of people overdo it during the cool down. Um, you got to remember your, your, your body is fatigued, your muscles are sore, they've already been sort of worked and damaged and so forth. Um, and if you sit down and try and do some intense stretching, um, you could very easily cause more problems um, to those muscles. So again, just very, very gentle, very, very easy. Um, your static stretches, you only want to hold them for five or six seconds. Again, it's just to elongate those muscles out, just to sort of lengthen those muscle fibers out. You're not trying to improve your flexibility. You're just trying to get some sort of looseness and, and stop you from tightening up. After I, 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 that's been taught many times is that's the time you want to increase your flexibility is after you work out. But yeah, yeah and, you know, again, and a, a common uh, sort of misconception. Um, some of the research I've looked at is that uh, is the best time is maybe two to three hours after your workout. Sure. Um, 
So your muscles have had enough time to recover. Uh, you know, you've you've sort of rehydrated. You've had had something to eat. Your muscles yeah. have sort of cooled down a little bit. Uh, and then you can go and do a little bit more intense stretching, uh, but definitely not straight after a workout. Um, Cause as I said, your muscles are fatigued. You're only going to hurt them. If They're very vulnerable at yeah. that point. Yes. That's, that's right. Yeah. I think this has been great information, Brad. I mean, uh, again, kind of flies in the face of what we've been taught. So it works out really well. You, you used the word nickel. Niggles. <laughs> yeah. I, I never heard that before. <laughs> oh, little, little twinges, you know, everyone's sure. had. It know, makes sense. Bit. It makes yeah, sense. Yeah. They're sort of knee aches or twinges or niggles or whatever. So yeah, little, little, little sore spots that come up. Sure. So when I, when I go for a run, I did this this morning, I will start by walking mm. first just to warm up and then I'll run and then I'll, I'll do what you say. I stop and I feel, Oh, that feels tight. I better stretch it a little bit. So that that's worked well for me. So niggles and twinges. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Do you what um you, uh should a person that are done working out, that's probably a great time to take in some water, I take it, and and food fairly quickly or yeah, 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 for sure. Um, you know, a lot when I when I train, um, even when I run, if I'm going to be running for any more than sort of half hour, uh, 40 minutes, I usually take a water bottle with me. Um, you know, I have one of those water bottles that you strap to your, to your waist sure. and it sort of yeah. sits, in, sits in the small of your back there. Um, yeah, and especially during hot weather, uh, during the summer, especially here in Australia, I'll, um, you know, even, even if I'm going out for a short workout, I'll always take water with me. Um, you know, again, it just comes back to that dehydration um, aspect. Uh, I can't remember the figures, but, you know, if you're sort of 1% dehydrated, it can sort of affect your performance by 10% or something. And I'm, I'm just sort of pulling figures out of the air there. But, um, but you know, it, it does have um, quite a big effect on your uh, ability to perform, uh, your ability to recover, um, and also that sort of prevention but, um, you know, if you can train better and you're much less likely of, of hurting yourself or getting injured. So, yeah, always keeping water handy. Obviously, on the bike, I always have water. At the pool, I always have water. Uh, if you're at the gym, you should always be have, uh, you know, you should always have water with you and just sort of be sipping throughout your workouts. Do you um, purposely try to include electrolytes in some form or... Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, especially with uh, in uh, like the endurance athletes that I've worked with, um, most of them include some sort of sports drink, which includes electrolytes. Um, I, uh, I I just make my own, to be honest. Um, so I'll I'll use a little bit of uh, fruit juice or something for flavour. Um, I'll put a, a couple of tablespoons of sugar in there, and um, I'll put some uh, some uh, sea salt uh, organic sea salt in there as okay. well um and I, I just make that up myself um sports drinks are extremely expensive and, um you know i can make my own sports sports drink for you know cents compared to right uh, dollars so um yeah i just do that and uh and that seems to work quite well for me um, i recommend of, that and some of them have way too much sugar um, yeah 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 exactly um, so uh you know and they have a lot of other stuff they they flavors and colors and all that sort of stuff as well so you, if you right. can avoid any of that um all the better yeah i take the um noon tablets they're n-u-u-n mm. i just put it in the water and off i go so they seem yeah. to work pretty well mm. um let's talk about overtraining uh can you tell maybe describe what some of the signs of overtraining are yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, it's obviously it's really helpful to be able to sort of self monitor yourself and, you know, be able to sort of, you know, pick up on some of the signs and symptoms of, of, uh, of overtraining, um, because that's sort of the precursor to getting injury, you know, to getting injured. Yeah. Um, you know, if you can sort of monitor that and, um, you know, sort of see when some of these signs and symptoms are coming up it's much easier to be able to you know correct what you're doing and so forth and getting back to the the comment i made before about consistency um you know you want to be able to keep your training consistent over the over the long term 
Um, so yeah, some of the things to look out for, if, if you do monitor uh, your heart rate, um, you know, your resting heart rate is a good indicator of, uh, of how tired you are. Um, so if you get up in the morning and your heart rate's uh, higher than it normally is, um, that's a good indicator. Um, but other things like if you, if you get sort of frequent um, uh, infections, frequent sort of colds and flus, sure. um, and, and not necessarily full-blown colds and flus, but you're always just a little bit headachey or you're a bit sure. sniffly or your throat's a bit scratchy or whatever, um, you know, these are all indicators that you might be getting a little bit run down. Um, minor injuries as well. If you are getting a lot of like little aches and pains and strains and sprains and that sort of stuff, um, you know, that's another indicator that you you might be getting a little bit run down. Um, you know, obviously, if you're feeling exhausted or you're feeling lethargic and tired all the time, um, uh, sudden sort of weight loss and weight gain can be, um, you know, an indicator that you're starting to get a little bit overtrained. Um, what else? Uh, like intolerance to exercise. Um, you just, you know, you just sort of, um, you know, we've all had that feeling where you don't right. really want to go out and exercise, exactly. but a lot of the times when you actually get out the door and you get into it, you start to feel good. And, you and know, you're glad you, you did it. You're glad you did it. Right. Um, but other times you sort of push yourself and even throughout the middle of the workout, you're just not feeling it. Um, and, you know, uh, delayed recovery from exercise. If you're doing, doing your training, but you're not recovering as quickly as you used to be. Um, these are all sort of physical signs that something's wrong. Um, other signs sort of you're just mentally fatigued or tired. Um, uh, you have a reduced ability to concentrate. Um, you've got no motivation. Maybe you're a little bit irritable or, or angry or depressed or sure. that sort of stuff. Um, sort of all these things are indicators that uh, you might be overdoing it a little bit. Now, I mean, any one or two of those by themselves is not a big deal. Um, sure. But if you find that you have a few of those and, and you know, the big one for me is just a, a lack of motivation um, sure. for, for, you know, for training and exercise. Um, for me, you know, I, I don't have a lot of problem getting out the door. I'm always looking forward to my next session. Um, but if I do notice that I am sort of, you know, I've really got to sort of force myself to, to do my workouts, that's sort of an indicator that I might need some, some you know, a little bit more time off. Um, I, you know, for a long time, I used to use a, a program of um, six weeks on and one week off. Um, so I'd sort of train regularly for six weeks and then I, I'd, I'd have one week off. Um, it didn't mean I just sat on the couch for a week. I, I still trained during that week, but it was sure. a very reduced, um, gotcha. intensity, reduced uh, workouts and so forth. Um, now I do four weeks on and one week off. As I'm getting older, I find <laughs> that I need uh, I need a little bit more more recovery time. Sure. Um, so yeah, yeah, I do that. I'll, I'll four weeks on, uh, and then I'll have um, a week off. Um, like I said, uh, it's not a it's not a, a, a you know a week on the couch eating burger rings and and, and, sure. and that sort of stuff. Um, I still train, but it's at a very reduced. Um, intensity and, and, and reduced uh, amount of training that I do. Yeah, I might mention too that, again, if you go to Brad's website, stretchcoach.com, he has a section there where, again, he has articles and he has one called How to Identify Overtraining Syndrome, uh, 23 Warning Signs. So cover a lot of the signs you cover here and some other ones, mm -hmm. of course, but yeah. So. Yeah, and I also uh, I, I also have like a, a recovery plan. If you you know read the article and you think, yeah, I that that's me. I'm I'm overtrained. Um, I have sort of a comprehensive recovery program where sort of guides you through what to do and how to do it and so forth to sort of get over your overtraining and back on top of things. Gotcha. That does that have anything to do with F I T T fit? Um, so the FIT, the FIT principle um, stands for frequency, intensity, time, and, uh, and type. Um, and I use that FIT principle uh, to help program the recovery week. 
Um, so obviously, for example, the F stands for frequency. So that's how many times you exercise in a week. Um, so say, for example, you exercise, you know, 12 times in a week. Um, what we might do during your recovery week is we just cut that in half. So you'd only do, say, five or six sessions for that week. And same with each of the other elements. Gotcha. The intensity, the yep. time and type. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, you also mentioned some other things, uh, increasing sleep, stretching, massage, foam rolling, heat. So all those things are really important for your recovery um, and they really help with, uh, you know, getting over overtraining. Um, during my recovery week, I always schedule a, a, um, a massage um, just to help with the recovery. Um, during that week, I increase the amount of stretching and, and that sort of stuff that I do. Um, sure. So instead of going for a run, for example, during my recovery week, um, I, I, I call it a, 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 a walk, jog, stretch. So I'll just walk, I'll jog for a few hundred metres, um, then I'll find a nice spot under a shady tree and stretch for five minutes. And then I'll walk for a little bit longer, maybe throw in a little bit of a jog here and there. Um, and they're just always increasing that stretching. Uh, when I get home, um, lots of heat, lots of massage, lots of foam rolling, all that sort of stuff. Um, it really does help with the recovery um, and, and long-term prevents a lot of those injuries. Do you just use a, a regular heat pad or what do you use? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I just got a couple of those uh, sort of large size um, um, uh, like heat, heat pads. Sure. Yeah, and I just throw them in the microwave, heat them up and oh, sure. uh, yeah, use them. Now, this is a good section. I hope you have time to cover this yet. Um, Training with the injury, you know, uh, my son ran cross country, pretty good runner, and I would help the team out because a lot of got injured. But of course, trying to keep a runner down is very mm. difficult. So do you have any suggestions for, for tr run training with the injury, basically? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, first and foremost, active rest is much better than complete rest. Um, so... Uh, one of the worst things you can do is just sit on the couch and do nothing. Um, as you mentioned before, any athlete, that's very hard to do anyway. Yes, it is, yes. um, so, but yeah, a lot of the times, and especially if you go to um, doctor, for example, uh, they'll usually tell you just to rest, you know, take right. some Pan Panadol or Advil or whatever yep. uh, and do nothing. Um, that, that is not the, the thing you want to be doing. You want to be doing active rest or active recovery. Um, that way you're continuing to promote blood, blood flow throughout the body. Um, it's that blood that's going to bring all those nutrients and oxygen and everything gotcha. yep. help with the recovery. Um, activity is also going to um, activate the lymphatic system. So that's going to help with drainage, getting rid of all those waste products and so forth. Um, so you want to be doing active rest, not complete rest. Um, the next thing you want to be looking at is working around the injury. So what can you do? Um, you know, not going to affect the injury, um, but you're able to work around the injury. Um, so, you know, if you've got a calf injury, then there's, there's no problems with doing um, other exercises for your upper body or something else. Um, that's going to, you know, keep you active, um, keep you recovering. And, uh, you know, the key is obviously not to put too much pressure or stress on that injury, but, um, you know, to keep moving and so forth. Um, then look at things like um, alternate training. Um, sure. You know, if you, if you are a runner, you probably don't spend enough time working on your core strength um, or your your, your back strength or your stability or anything like that. You probably don't spend enough time working on your flexibility. Um, right. So there's other things that you can do um, other than, you know, if you're a runner, uh, obviously running. Um, so yeah, think of other things that you can do that, um, that you've sort of, you've thought about doing or wanted to do, but uh, because you're a runner, you want to spend most of your time running. Um, so yeah, um, you know, water workouts. Uh, so doing something in the water is always uh, a good uh, alternate to um, your regular sort of training. Um, so yeah, if you are a runner, you may be able to do deep water running uh, in a pool where you, you know, you actually sure. run in the pool. Um, you're totally suspended in the water. So you're not actually putting any force or pressure on the injury, uh, but you're able to move and keep running, uh, you know, keep you know, in that running motion going. Um, and a lot of times, you know, I've worked with athletes who have been injured 
um, taken their recovery really seriously, like, you know, uh, structured their, uh, their recovery uh, just as sort of fanatically as they would normally structure their regular training. Um, and they've come out of it a much better athlete. You know, they've worked on some sure. of those areas that they knew that they should be working on, but hadn't, hadn't worked on, um, especially with runners, you know, they'll do a right. lot of deep water running and so forth. Um, and just that sort of forced rest and that forced recovery, um, oftentimes they'll come out the other side and they're a much better athlete for it. Exactly. Um, and we would, uh, I know when he ran in college, they would take one day a week and bike uh, mm. just to, as an alternative. So, but yeah, they include a lot, a lot of core workouts. So, well, Brad, I want to be respectful of your time. I, I really appreciate you taking another hour out of your day your day or the start of your day uh, to join us and give us some great information. As always, you're welcome back to the program again, if you got more information. Uh, so uh, if there's anything else we can do for you, please let us know. Bob, I always enjoy talking with you. It's a great opportunity to discuss these sort of things. And uh, yeah, I'm sure your viewers and I know I, I sent my uh, my subscribers over to the last video we did and I got a lot of positive comments from it. So hopefully people will get a lot out of this and, uh, you know, be able to keep training injury free. Yep. Fantastic. Take care. Excellent. Have a Thanks, great, Bob. Have a great day. You too. Bye bye.